welcome everyone to the ninth annual CR Arthritis event. I do want to welcome Dr. Dax Rumsey, who's an associate professor at the University of Alberta, as well as the director of Division of Pediatric Rheumatology at Sollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton. His main clinical and research interests are in the area of juvenile spondyloarthritis. That said, he also works with an adult population. And then during the AHPA, which is the Arthritis Health Professions Association pre-course, you shared a little bit on the topic of early identification and diagnosis of axial spondyloarthritis and how to get whether that's healthcare providers or non-healthcare providers involved. So really great to have you on our, our session today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So Dr. Rumsey, can you tell us maybe a little bit about yourself and how you got into such a unique specialty? Sure. Yeah. So as you mentioned, I'm Dr. Rumsey. I'm a pediatric rheumatologist in Edmonton, Alberta. So I work with pediatric patients, so children, um, with all different kinds of rheumatic diseases. But my kind of main interest is patients with a type of arthritis called spondyloarthritis. So spondylo actually, I think, comes from the word that uh, spondy, which means spine. So it's typically arthritis, which involves the spine, but there's also like a spectrum of other conditions that are associated with that. Um, in terms of how I got involved in rheumatology, that's a good question. So I I always knew I wanted to work with kids, so I got into pediatrics. And then I, um, when I was doing my rotation in pediatric rheumatology, I really loved the both the specialty and the person I was working with. So that made me more interested in this. And then Within rheumatology, as I've gone along, I've got a special, I've just had a special interest in these type of patients over time. Wonderful. Thank you. And can I ask a little bit more about this kind of axial spondyloarthritis? Can you tell us maybe a little bit about how it is more traditionally diagnosed? And now that you know, shared with us that it does involve the spine. Yeah, exactly. So, so good question. Um, and I should have mentioned earlier that I'm also involved, as you mentioned, in the IDA initiative, which is the early identification and diagnosis of axial spondyloarthritis. So a bit more about that. So that's like, I'm involved in a group called SPARTAN. It's kind of an acronym and it's it stands for like the Spondyloarthritis Research and Treatment Network. Um, and it's in like, it's all North American rheumatologists that are interested in this area, but it's mostly uh, US based. So there's a lot of American rheumatologist in it and some from Canada and Mexico. And so this IDA program is like, we got a large educational grant to try to educate um, non-rheumatologists about this disease with the goal of like, so that they can recognize it earlier and then get it, get these patients referred to rheumatologists and treat it earlier. And so they have better outcomes. So that's what we've been kind of working on. And we've developed like presentations about it and like um, case-based presentations and we've been presenting these across North America to different groups. And that's what we did at the AHPA meeting. So we talked about that. And so that really relates to the question you're saying. So what is, what is it and how is it most traditionally diagnosed? So axial spondyloarthritis is arthritis, which is inflammation of joints, as you know, um, but mostly involving this axial disease or the spine. And um, usually it occurs in younger people. So when I say younger, I mean like under like 45, 40 to 45 years of age. So all of my patients are under 40. So that's like all the pediatric patients, but also more like younger adults. So usually how it presents is that patients typically have what's called inflammatory back pain. So there's a lot, of, a ton of patients, people that get back pain, but it's not all what we call inflammatory back pain. So Inflammatory back pain is more like you're more stiff in the morning when you wake up and it kind of gets better throughout the day as you're doing activity. And also like it could wake you up from sleep because of the inflammation. And also there's a thing called gelling phenomenon where people kind of, if you're sitting on a large, like for a long time or in a car ride, then you start to get stiff and sore from it as opposed to more mechanical back pain, which is like usually worse with activity. And worse at the end of the day, this type of pain is like worse at the beginning. And as you do things, it gets better. And so typically a patient with younger patient, they could be older, but it had to at least start when they were a bit younger. So with inflammatory back pain, 
Sometimes they can have other signs and symptoms um, that are related to axial spondyl arthritis. So it's also associated with psoriasis, so like a scaly type of rash, so if you have that, or like inflammation of the eye, so uveitis, or like also gut inflammation, so people with like inflammatory bowel disease or those kind of symptoms. So <clears throat> usually if you have any of those symptoms, <clears throat> you would present to the doctor, and they can do some initial investigations, such as like some blood work, so like a CRP would be helpful often, that's like an inflammatory blood test, so that can be elevated, but it's not always elevated. Also, there's a genetic blood test called HLA-B27, and that can be positive, but it really is a like largely a clinical diagnosis at first because you can have totally normal blood work and still have the disease. And then kind of the next step usually in adults is that you would get an X-ray. So you typically get an X-ray of your like lower spine, and it can show changes on the X-ray. But then often the x-ray kind of misses a lot of cases. So you often then need an MRI. If the, even if the x-ray is normal, you could have changes on your MRI. Or even some people don't have any changes on any of the imaging. <laughs> you can still have the disease. So it really is like a, a clinical diagnosis, primarily supported by blood work and imaging. And if it's suspected, it would be great to like get the patient referred to rheumatology as soon as possible. Man, I, I didn't know that. And thank you for sharing that with us in, in such, you know, really um, great detail, because like you said, it, it could be, you could have the condition, but whether it's your blood test doesn't match up with your x-ray, your x-ray doesn't match up with your symptoms, your symptoms. Yeah. And it, so I can see why, why it is so important to have everyone involved, right? Like we need all, like all hands, all eyes out, like to, to ensure that because it is also at, like you said, the spine, like how many people have back pain, have mechanical right. back pain, right? So I, exactly. I see how we could misdiagnose or just be like, oh, you just have back pain because you've been sitting at your desk all day. It's like, no, yeah. there's there's all these nuances. Like you said, it you typically have it worse in the morning versus the mechanical. This is typically worse with more mechanical loading, which is yeah. more use, right? So exactly. It, I can definitely see the importance of this initiative. Can you tell us a little bit more then about, you know, how non-rheumatologists, how these non-allied care providers, yeah. sorry, these allied care providers can actually assist in the diagnosis? Yeah, that's a great question because I find a lot of people with back pain, like they won't often necessarily go to their doctor or their family doctor. They'll often go to a lot of other providers. So like such as physiotherapists or massage therapists or chiropractors or a lot of different type, even like acupuncture, things like that. And so all those uh, providers also probably see a lot of people with back pain. And they also probably mostly see patients with mechanical back, true mechanical back pain. So it would be important for, to, like that's what one of our initiatives is to try to educate some of these providers about the condition as well, so that they can kind of pick up on clues that it might be something else going on. So like, if it seems more, more more inflammatory type pain, or if they have like other signs and symptoms, like if they have some rash that seems to be psoriasis or like a family history of a similar thing. Um, and then like they, yeah, so like that would be helpful if, if they know the signs and symptoms would be able to like refer them to the appropriate channels, like to, to rheumatology. And like the whole goal is to get them diagnosed as early as possible. So they get on the proper treatment and they can prevent, we can prevent the complications. Because if you, if it's untreated for many years, then you can get long-term complications, like kind of fusion of your spine, like ankylosis, extra bone formation. And I mean, the worst case scenario, if they were missed for a very long time, they could have like total fusion of their spine and kind of bamboo spine and a lot of chronic pain from it. So I think it's really, really, really important to have um, non-rheumatologists or other allied healthcare providers like on board and understanding what's going on yeah absolutely you know having everyone on board yeah and can i ask if someone you know listening is you know realizing that yes my back pain is primarily worse in the morning and it's kind of stiff but as i move around especially if i do some light chores or some stretching it gets better what what should they do and and who should they go to see, for example? Yeah, it's a great question. So 
I do think it's important. Yeah. If they kind of have those symptoms, like I think some of the, a lot of these other allergy healthcare providers can be helpful, like with some of the, even if it is axial spondyl arthritis. So like getting some physio started wouldn't hurt anyone or things like that. But also I think it's really important to kind of present to your primary care provider, like your family doctor, and then try to t explain what's going on. And, and I mean, it depends on the family doctor, but some people are more or less open to you kind of like trying to educate the doctor about it if they're not kind of thinking it and saying like basically that you're hoping to get some of these tests done. And if it's not really getting anywhere and it's not getting better, then to ideally get a referral to a rheumatologist. Because actually I, through doing some of this work, I actually met um, the the chair of the Canadian Spondylar Spondylitis Association. Um, and he's actually, his name is Ellie. He's he's actually a physician himself, and he has axial spondyl arthritis. So he was an orthopedic doctor, and then he had this he had these symptoms, and he went for to like several different doctors, and none, no one really like diagnosed it, and he even had X-rays which were normal. So they kept telling him it was probably mechanical pain. Eventually, he got an MRI, and it showed all the inflammatory changes. So then he was on the right treatment, and now he's doing like much better. But he was saying, like, it's amazing how, like, much education we need to provide, even within the medical field, like, how, like, under, um, like, under-recognized this is. And it's such, part of the issue is that family doctors are so busy and they have to see so many different patients with so many different conditions. So it's no fault of their own that they're not, like, totally aware of every condition. But we're trying to, um, we're actually working with him now, too, to try to educate more and more family doctors and residents and other trainees throughout Canada about this to raise the issue, I guess. So. Yeah, I think it, you know, having a rare disease day this has passed this week. I, you know, I realized um, we, we call them rare diseases, but they may be less rare than we think yeah. they are. And just simply underdiagnosed because as you said, there's just so many conditions to know, right? True. It is not the, the, role of a family care provider to know all of them but how can yeah. you know everyone on on the team right every every care right. provider in any capacity and um, keep an eye out for for some of these symptoms that that we know um help to differentiate exactly. the the types of back pain that are most true common. yeah and the other part of it is that it was classically thought of as more like almost exclusively like a male condition or like it's more common in men, which it probably is a little bit, but we're more and more realizing that more actually women have the same condition as just being underdiagnosed in them. And so this is also becoming a more commonly known thing. And also like thinking of, like it's also thought to at first to be like primarily Caucasian condition, but like it's more and more, people are more realizing that it's actually more common in, in women and in other people with other races and ethnicities as well so this is a big like a big issue too this is incredible work that you're doing right because i now we're realizing not only is this uh is a medical issue this is a health equity issue this is a social right, justice, exactly. right the work the work that you do is not only in health and i and i always try to tell healthcare providers you you are not only a healthcare provider right? yeah that researchers do is so incredible so Thanks. thank you Dr. Dax Ramsey for all sharing all of your knowledge with us and, you know, helping walk us through some of the nuanced differences between mechanical and inflammatory back pain. And um, do you have any last pieces of advice, tips to share with our audience, maybe those who are currently self-managing uh, or self-caring for axial spondylar arthritis? Yeah, I think the one piece of advice I would say is what I learned from Ellie, like to kind of never give up. Like if you're not getting any good answers from someone or you feel like your pain or symptoms aren't improving to like not give up if you're not getting any answers from one person try to like go further like learn more about it and maybe seek out other providers if necessary i love that thank you thank you for for those words so you heard it from a doctor as well if you know you know you have back pain you know so there's something wrong it's okay to keep advocating for yourself definitely Wonderful. So with that, we're going to thank our audience for joining us. And we hope you tune into the next session of CR Arthritis. Take care, everyone. And